All right, unit five, the Krebs cycle, or the citric acid cycle. It's broken up into two main parts. The first part is the PDH complex, so we'll talk about the reactions and the regulation of all the enzymes and how it responds to energy charge. We'll talk about the Krebs cycle itself, the reaction, the energy produced, the regulation of it, which is very simple, and other molecules that are produced out of the Krebs cycle. So, so far we've gone from glucose to pyruvate, and that was in glycolysis. We're going to go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, which I'm always going to write down as C2-CoA. It's a nice reminder that uh, there's two carbons in it. So that's via the PDH complex. And then from acetyl-CoA to ATP, which is the Krebs cycle, with the citric acid cycle mixed with oxidative phosphorylation, which is unit six. We'll talk about that in the next video. So where we left off was with pyruvate. Pyruvate was made into from glucose in the cytosol where glycolysis happened, and then it's going into the mitochondria. So it goes to the outer membrane first through a porin channel and goes to the inner mitochondrial membrane through pyruvate translocase. So for questions, always keep in mind that there's three different membranes that you have to be aware of. There's the cell membrane, the outermost, also called the plasma membrane. These are the, the two mitochondrial membranes. There's two different ones. Most of them are the inner, usually the outer one is porin. Uh, and then there's one on the endoplasmic reticulum, which is in a later unit, but always keep note, just like keeping note of which enzymes are membrane bound, keep note if there's any on a specific membrane as well. Or which membrane it is, rather. So the next step is from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, which is via the PDH complex. So we'll look in that in a little more detail. This is how he draws it out. There's not that many questions on it. It's more of the regulation, so if you don't perfectly understand it, uh, that's okay. I'll highlight the important parts of it. There are three main enzymes to it that you don't actually need to know their name. Uh, just know E1, E2, and E3. And these are the, the reactions which we're going to go through that the enzymes catalyze and any coenzymes whether it's a prosthetic group or a co-substrate, that's a CS, which are what's going to be questioned the most. So for starting with pyruvate, which we said is a C3 molecule, remember glucose is a C6 and it eventually was split into two C3, that's why for every one glucose you get two pyruvate. In the first reaction here, you're going to produce some CO2 and the other two carbon molecules are going to be attached to TPP. So the second reaction, the two carbons are going to come off of TPP, which is the prosthetic group and jump on to the next prosthetic group which is lipoate. Lipoate is going to be written several times in its oxidized state and its partially oxidized state here and then in its reduced state. So that's not as important to know. Just know that lipoate is the next prosthetic group coenzyme. So in the second reaction lipoate takes the two carbons. color code all these prosthetic groups. So in reaction three, that's where the acetyl-CoA gets produced. So the CoA comes in, and that's the co-substrate, and it takes the two carbons 
from WIP08 and makes acetyl-CoA. So now that acetyl-CoA is going to go off to the Krebs cycle. So reactions 1, 2, and 3 make the acetyl-CoA. Reactions 4 and 5 are kind of recycling the enzymes to reset the PDH complex for the next round of pyruvate that comes in. So now we have that reduced lipo8 here. In reaction 4, it's going to react with FAD and create FADH2. So then the lipo8 is now back in its oxidized position, ready to go through this reaction here again. Now you have a FADH2, and the fifth reaction, the fifth and final reaction, you have another co-substrate come in. This NAD+, and it's going to make it NADH. So that's important. Keep in mind that it does produce this NADH. So the major products of the PDH reaction are this NADH here, the acetyl-CoA, which is going to enter the Krebs cycle, and a byproduct of the CO2, which accounts for the carbon that uh, from C3 pyruvate to C2 acetyl-CoA. The last two reactions were catalyzed by E3. E2 only does this middle one right here. The most common questions about this are regulation, but from this specifically, it's all about the which vitamins make up the prosthetic groups or co-substrates. Easiest way to learn it is 1, 2, 3, 5. So that's B1, which is thiamine. So that's TPP. The FAD and FADH come from B2, or riboflavin. The NADH at the end comes from B3, or niacin. And every time you see CoA, immediately think pantothenate. PDH complex is dependent on all four of these. Lipo8 is its own separate thing. And so it's also Lipo8 dependent, but that's not vitamin derived. So the regulation of it is a little complex just for E1. The second part of it is pretty easy. It's very similar to uh, step three of glycolysis where you have an enzyme called PDH kinase which is going to inactivate E1 by attaching a phosphate and then PDH phosphatase will undo that or activate PDH by removing the phosphate leaving the OH there. So the two points of regulation for E1 are in the, the, these enzymes here. So we'll look at PDH kinase The PDH kinase, as we set up here, is going to inactivate E1, so it's an inhibitor of the PDH complex reaction. ADP and pyruvate inhibit. So the hard thing to understand here is that it's a double negative. You're inhibiting an inhibitor. So ADP and pyruvate will block this inactivation from happening. So overall, for the PDH complex, it's it'll catalyze it. It's a positive reaction. It will stop this from happening, so it'll keep it more in this active form. So the NADH and acetyl-CoA are activating an inhibitor. So you're activating this reaction right here. And by activating that reaction, you're actually inactivating overall the PDH complex. If you can wrap your head around that, that'll be the hardest concept of this unit, I think. Um, PDH phosphatase is nice and easy. This reaction is stimulated by calcium. So calcium activates this into its active form.
The rest of the regulation is pretty simple. E2 and E3 are grouped together, and it's mass activation. So if you have substrates for the reaction, they're going to activate it. If you have NAD, you want to keep processing that. If you have CoA, you want to keep processing that. So that's going to stimulate E2 and E3. Once you've done that, once you've you know, used up your NAD and turned it into NADH, the products are going to inhibit. So if you have enough NADH or if you have enough uh, acetyl-CoA, that's going to stop E2 and E3 from happening, from catalyzing those reactions. Remember the whole point of glycolysis into the PDH complex, into the Krebs cycle, is all to create ATP. So if you have things like ATP or its precursors, acetyl-CoA and NADH, that's going to stop uh, the PDH complex from happening. So these, these energy ones are kind of, they're not E1, E2, or E3 specific, they're the PDH complex as a whole. So on, on the other hand, pyruvate turns into these things, ADP turns into ATP. So if you have those things, if you have low energy compounds, you're going to keep stimulating them to make ATP. So if you have lots of these, keep processing them, p keep the PDH complex working, and end up with these. So that, that creates the, the regulatory balance. I'm going to come back to the stuff at the bottom in a minute. All right, Krebs cycle. Like always, I recommend actually knowing all of the reactions. It might help you on a um, question or two to be able to like write them out fully. Uh, if you're not going to do that, here are the basics of what you need to know. So we're going to do a couple things as we go through. We'll talk about the metabolite, how many carbons are involved, and what enzyme catalyzes the reaction and if there's anything that you need to know about that. So the first reaction you had your acetyl-CoA freshly produced from the PDH complex which is a C2 molecule mixes with uh, oxaloacetate which is a C4 molecule and those two are going to be combined by citrate synthase and you make citrate which is a C6 molecule. 2 plus 4 equals 6. Aconitase is the next enzyme which turns citrate into isocitrate. The thing to know about that is that it's an iron sulfur enzyme. So you have those two elements involved. Isocitrate turns into alpha-ketoglutarate by isocitrate dehydrogenase. So we're going to start skipping around a little bit to highlight some important parts here. When you're memorizing these, look for all the dehydrogenases here. Reaction 3, 4, 6, and 8 all have a dehydrogenase. And that's going to help you remember their byproducts as well. So we said 3, 4, 6, and 8. 3, 4, and 8 all produce NADH. Reaction 6 is going to produce FADH2. So those are important things to keep in mind. We'll come back to that in a minute. So these first two DHs also produce a CO2 molecule as a byproduct. So as you lose a carbon, you, you lose a carbon here. So it's going from a C6 to a C, C5 molecule. Alpha-ketoglutarate, when it changes into succinyl-CoA, it loses another carbon. So that's why it goes from a C5 to a C4. And now that C4 molecule, these metabolites are all going to remain C4 
up until acetate when it gets combined with acetyl-CoA again, and around, around it goes. Alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is very similar to the PDH complex. It has all of the same prosthetic groups, all of the same co-substrates. So, vitamin 1, thiamine, 2, riboflavin, 3, niacin, and 5, pantothenate, and it's also lipoate dependent. The regulation of it is more simple. Alright, so the next one we have succinyl CoA going into succinate by succinyl CoA synthetase. This one produces a GTP in humans. So we'll keep that GTP in mind in a minute here. Reaction 6, uh, succinate dehydrogenase, that's what creates the FADH2. <clears throat> so that one is FAD dependent, so riboflavin dependent, B2. It's also an iron sulfur enzyme. So keep those things in mind about enzyme 6. Then we go to fumarate to malate. Nothing exciting about that one. And then malate to oxaloacetate by malate de dehydrogenase. And that creates another NADH. So for keeping track of how much energy we made, we said we have three total NADHs. So every NADH is worth 2.5 ATP, which makes a total of 7.5 ATP. Reaction 6 gave us one FADH2, which is worth less. So one of those at 1.5 gives us 1.5 ATP and one, t one GTP can be converted into an ATP so we get one from there so from the Krebs cycle we get the equivalent of 10 ATP per full rotation we're going to do more math with these numbers in the next unit oxidative phosphorylation So yeah, that's the overview of all the important things to know about these. Um, I would recommend, like I said before, knowing which ones have water in them, or you know, knowing the full the full reactions will help you. But regulation is going to be where it's going to ask more questions on. Citric acid regulation is so much easier than glycolysis regulation. I've summarized it all into this little chart right here. Um, it's regulated in reactions 3 and 4. Reactions 3 and 4 are both stimulated by calcium. Reaction 3 is also stimulated by ADP. Both of them are inhibited by high energy things. ATP and NADH. This also has a product negative feedback thing with succinyl-CoA. So this was reaction 3, catalyzed by isocitrate dehydrogenase, and this was the alpha-ketoglutarate. This reminded me, one more thing uh, to note are the irreversible reactions. So the three irreversible ones are any time where there's a carbon change, is how I remember it. So if we lost CO2s in 3 and 4, that means three and four are irreversible. That makes sense. They're also the regulatory ones. Regulatory uh, steps or enzymes are usually irreversible. Step one, combining 
C4 and C2 is also irreversible. It's not a regulatory step though. So this is how the Krebs cycle works for producing energy. It can also produce other things. It's connected to some other pathways, which you learn about later in biochemistry too. So one of the last slides kind of summarizes that, but if you want it in table form, it's right here. Citrate can lead to fatty acids and sterols. Alpha ketoglutarate can lead to glutamate, other amino acids and purines. Axeloacetate can make aspartate purines, pyrimidines, or other amino acids. And succinyl coa can make porphins, heme groups, chlorophyll, and glycine. He likes to ask about that glycine. Um, only cue on that one uh, to memorize it. Alpha ketoglutarate makes glutamate. Axeloacetate makes aspartate. So it makes the ones it sounds like or makes the acidic amino acids that are kind of based in, in the name.